Hey guys, welcome back to the Historian's Craft. So, um, this is getting pretty close to the end of the series on Japanese history to 1868. I know I said I had them done, and I did, but upon editing them I realized that I missed some stuff in the past couple videos. Um, so I decided to cut them all and I re-recorded them, which is what you're watching now. So we have two or three left, and then this series is wrapped up. Um, so... If you have, you know, taken a survey course on Japan or global history or you've read a couple books or maybe you know something about Japan in this period between about 1600 and about 1868, and especially if you're an American, I guarantee you, you've probably heard this, what you probably know is that Japan was closed off in, in some manner to the world and then they got opened up. Well, that's not incorrect, but it's not entirely accurate either. So this whole idea of Japan becoming more open to the West, becoming more open to the world, is going to be the recurring theme in the last couple episodes of this series, and we're going to keep going with it um, in the companion series I have going to this one from Japanese history 1868 to the modern day. So the Edo period, roughly 1600 to 1868, depending on where you want to start and when you want to cut it off, sees a fairly drastic Japanese intellectual revolution. Um, and this intellectual revolution, combined with the impact of westernization in Japan, the collapse of Chinese power in East Asia sets the stage for multiple events in Japanese history after 1868. The Meiji Restoration, the coups of the 1920s and 30s, this theme of government by the sword, um, which we'll get into more in the other series, the ferocity of the Imperial Japanese Army and the Imperial Japanese Military in World War II, the development of Japanese imperialism, Japanese colonialism, etc. This is when it begins. So, around 1600, roughly, most of the Westerners are thrown out of Japan and they're not allowed back. So the Portuguese are kicked out, the Spanish are kicked out, the English are kicked out, etc. The Dutch are allowed to stay. But they have to stay on this tiny little artificial island in Nagasaki Harbor um, called Deshima. If you want to go into Japan, you have to show a passport. You have to be under armed guard. There are certain places in Japan you cannot go. Once a year, you have to go pay homage or, or give some form of honor, uh, give a gift to the Tokugawa shogun. So they're kind of prisoners in Japan, but they have access to the trade. And it's through the Dutch that the Japanese are able to get news from Europe and eventually the United States once that country is founded. What they're getting from the Dutch is not only news about the world, they're getting Western science, Western technology, Western medicine, etc. This eventually develops into what's called uh, Rangaku, Dutch learning, sometimes it's called barbarian learning. It's exactly what you think it is, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's attempting to learn European things from the Europeans. So how do you do this? Well, you have to learn Dutch, maybe you have to learn German, maybe you have to learn English. None of the Japanese are really astute at this, but what it eventually starts is an intellectual revolution in Japan because they realize that through the study, for example, of Western medicine, all the Chinese texts are basically wrong. You cut open the body, it does not look like what the Chinese medical manuals say the interior of the body is supposed to look like. So some Japanese start thinking, well, maybe the Chinese aren't all they're cracked up to be. Maybe the West is. This eventually fosters what's called kokugaku, national learning. The idea basically is that well, we have rangaku on the one hand, and we have East Asian learning, we have Chinese and Korean stuff on the other hand. How do we take the best of both? How do we discover, and I mean really discover, what the underlying Japanese thing is in the East Asian learning? How do we pull that out? How do we get the Japanese away from the Chinese and the Korean and the, and the Mongolian texts and the Buddhist texts. And how do we get the stuff that we really need from the Dutch learning from Rangaku, and how do we put them together to develop a powerful nation? This is part of what Kokugaku is all about. So one of the key themes in Japanese history 
is also this idea of a dualistic power structure. You have the Shogun, but you also have the Emperor. So you have the Imperial family, the court, where power is supposed to reside, and then you have the Shogunate, the Bakufu, the government of the Samurai by and for the Samurai. You also have conflict between Samurai and court nobility. Buddhism and what eventually becomes Shinto, Japan versus the outside world. So my, my point is that there are multiple power structures in Japanese society up to this time. But in imperial times, 1868 to 1945, and in the modern day now, all the way up to 2021, there isn't really a dualistic power anymore. There's just the Japanese federal government. How does this happen? How does this develop? Well, this is going to be a theme that we trace over the next couple episodes, and we trace in the companion series as well. But the probably, but probably the key starting point here uh, would be the Empress Misho. So she's born in 1623, and she reigns by herself 1629 to 1643. So the Tokugawa shoguns, when they take power, when they become the Bakufu, they basically try to take power away from the imperial family, but not completely. They set up a castle in Kyoto to keep an eye on the imperial family. They take away the power of the imperial family to grant titles, including shogun. Only the Tokugawa can now do this. Um, and in 1615, they limit the ability of the emperor and the aristocrats to basically do anything except pursue cultural matters, to pursue the arts. However, to really get a hold on this, they marry some of the Tokugawa into the imperial family. This leads to the Empress Misho, who is, you know, first of all, the first reigning female empress in, in over 800 years. This is huge. Um, and the other is that she's the granddaughter of the second Tokugawa shogun. So, what she represents is a blend of imperial and warrior families, imperial and warrior cultures. It's manifested in this one person. So, although there are dualistic power structures, sometimes that power gets blended into the individual. Later on, when Japan is attempting to establish you know, their own nation, when they're, when they're trying to build a nation-state, this thing that we now know as the modern country of Japan, and they're trying to figure out, well, where does the emperor fit into this? Where do the samurai? They look back to Empress Misho, because the fact that Japan has an imperial family, the fact that they have an emperor, and the fact that that emperor can be female becomes extremely important to Japanese nationalism, because they basically say, well, we have an empress, we have an imperial system where women can rule, that makes Japan and the Japanese natural. We come out of nature. This becomes important uh, because when Japan is attempting to construct their own modern nation-state, the fact that Japan has an imperial family and the fact that a member of that imperial family can be a woman, can be an empress and rule, what this does to Japanese nationalism is it says, well, we have the ability to have a woman on the throne. This means that, in contrast to basically everybody else in East Asian culture, Japan is natural. Because in Shinto and in Taoism, many other East Asian belief sets besides, nature has a feminine quality to it. This is where life comes from. Well, if the Japanese have the ability to have an empress on the throne, the Japanese are natural. They're superior to everybody else because they come from nature. So I realize I kind of have been jumping around a little bit with all the different topics I've been covering so far, but this is all going to come together. Anyway, in the 1700s, roughly, the Russians start showing up because they're trying to colonize Siberia. Well, if you're going to colonize Siberia, you have all these settlements, you need, on the one hand, you need resources, you need food, and you need markets to trade all the things you're creating and gathering in these colonies, specifically furs. So the Russians start showing up in Japan and they want to trade. The Japanese say, no, we don't want this. You are barbarians, you're outsiders. We want nothing to do with you. There was actually one uh, recorded instance where they board each other's ships and they kill each other, and this pisses off both governments. But the Japanese still want nothing to do with the Russians. The British and the French show up as well. Uh, the Japanese don't want trade. 
The British and French don't necessarily want Japanese trade just to trade with the Japanese. They're also looking for coaling stations and refueling stations because they're trying to trade with China. And Japan's right there. The key thing, though, would be the Second Opium War. So in the First and the Second Opium War, the British crush the Chinese militarily. In, or on, rather, October 7th, 1860, the British forces loot Beijing and they loot the Imperial Qing Summer Palace. Between the 18th and 19th of October, it's burned. A couple of years before this, the U.S. becomes interested in gaining access to Japan because they want to trade with China. Japan's right on the way, so they need coaling stations, they need to take on water, etc. They also need to, you know, rescue shipwrecked whalers who have been stranded in Japan. So they send Matthew Calbraith Perry with a mission to try to open Japan up to U.S. interests. The Japanese don't want this. So Perry leaves, goes to China, gets translators, comes back, and he shows up in 1853. And he shows up with all these ships and all these guns. And he doesn't leave. He disembarks with all of the soldiers carrying rifles and his ships sitting in Edo Harbor with their cannon fully loaded and trained on the city. And he says, look, I'm going to come back in a year. When I do, this document I've given you with you know, an outline for how we want to trade, how we want to establish relations, etc. When I come back in a year, 1854, you better figure this out, otherwise I'm going to basically blow up Tokyo. <laughs> so he leaves, and the shogun doesn't know what to do. They know there are problems with China, with, with the West. So he calls the daimyo together, and he says, what do I do? This is a huge mistake, because it shows the daimyo that the Japanese shogun isn't as powerful as he is made out to be. So some of them start looking around for another way to, you know, deal with this problem. This idea of a dualistic power structure in Japanese society says, well, if it's not the shogun, maybe the emperor can give us some guidance. So some of the daimyo start going over to the imperial family. Eventually, they decide on two courses of action. One is fight the Americans, fight the British, fight the Dutch, fight the French. That's not a good idea. The Japanese firearms are at this point outdated. The Japanese military has been out of practice. The samurai have been out of practice. Um, there's apprehension and fear about recruiting commoners into a military. So the other option is, well, we give the West what they want and we'll figure out what to do with it. So, this happens. Perry comes back, and they basically acquiesce. When the Second Opium War happens, and the Imperial Palace in Beijing is burned, many Japanese look at this and say, Ooh, oh, oh, okay, uh, China, for centuries, has been the key power in East Asia. Well, it's not the key power anymore. The West destroyed it. What do we do? Do we keep bending over to the West? Do we keep giving them what they want and potentially end up like China? Well, we can't fight them. So maybe it's a good idea to adopt Western ideas and become more like the West so we don't become like China. So this is where this whole idea starts. The key, though, for all of this is that although Japan's scared, the treaties they sign with Perry and then eventually with um, Harris, who's a, a, another American who shows up a little bit later, is that in contrast to the treaties signed by the Chinese with the British and the French, the Japanese uh, don't lose nearly as much. The Chinese basically have to give up trading rights in 10 ports. Three ports were in the interior of China. The Japanese only lose five to trading rights, so they still control most of the mercantile activity in most Japanese ports. The British warships are allowed anywhere in China. Not really like that in Japan. The foreigners can't go anywhere they please. Um, interior travel is prohibited. So you, you can see on the screen here, I have all the lists. But the key is that in China, land is ceded. Hong Kong. Not in Japan. So although Japan is forced to open up to the West, 
they're not necessarily weakened. They're just being thrown through a loop, and they have to figure out what to do. In early 1858, Harris, who is another American who's dispatched after Perry, shows up, uh, and shogunate representatives basically draft a treaty. This is the famous Harris Treaty. Basically what it is, and this is in a cut-down form, the, the shogun asks for a two-month delay um, to ratify anything because the shogun realizes he doesn't have all the power anymore and he needs to cooperate with the daimyo and he needs to cooperate with the imperial family. He figures maybe if I get the imperial family to back me up, well, the, 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 the daimyo will, you know, keep supporting me. Because he realizes that at this point, uh, his power is becoming a little less secure. That doesn't happen. He doesn't get imperial support. In 1858, in early June, the shogun appoints this guy, Ienasuke, to uh, the office of Tyro. This was an imp this was a shogunal office. Um, basically, it means great counselor. Basically, what this is is like you know in Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire, you have the king, and then you have the hand of the king. The king is in charge, but the hand carries everything out. Same idea, or at least similar idea. E8 decides to sign the treaty without imperial approval. He does this on July 29th, 1858. He also then decides to make Yokohama, which is a... Well, now it's part of the Greater Tokyo area. At this point, it was a coastal city, kind of close to Tokyo. Eventually, the two cities just grow and grow, and they eventually kind of merge. Um... But he decides to give Yokohama as the port rather than Kanagawa because it, it's in a more defensible position. If something were to happen, um, theoretically, shogunal forces could arrive more quickly. Th there's a number of reasons why he does this. But a lot of Japanese, especially the daimyo, don't like this. And arguments ensue. What do you do? How do you calm down the daimyo? You get the imperial family to basically say, shut up, this is what we're doing, because many daimyo are now going over to the emperor. So he tries to do that. He tries to pressure the young emperor to approve the Harris Treaty. He also installs a new shogun, a little bit younger. He tries to punish the daimyo and the court nobles who, you know, had opposed the treaty. Why? Because he's trying to hang on to shogunal power. The shogunate doesn't do something. They realize, they see the way the wind is blowing. The impact of the West could potentially destabilize Japan and make the Tokugawa family lose power. Uh, they also have the uh, Ansei Purge. So the Ansei Purge is this period in Japanese history when Ienosuke is basically trying to throw everybody who opposed him in jail. He's trying to eliminate threats. He's not doing this to be a dictator or to be dictatorial. He's trying to preserve Tokugawa power and ensure that nothing bad happens and ensure that nothing bad happens to Japan because of everything that's going on. Well, in 1860, on March 24th, Ienosuke is assassinated at an Edo Castle gate. And then we have a series of earthquakes just before this. These are the infamous Anse quakes. Uh, between 1858 and 1860, there's a cholera epidemic in Edo. 1858, yeah, there's the Anse Purge, I just mentioned this. The Harris Treaty is signed, etc., etc. 1860, there's an Edo Castle fire. My, my point is that there's a whole bunch of stuff happening, and it's not looking good for the Tokugawa. People are getting scared. They're slowly coming to the realization that the Tokugawa shogunate doesn't have all the power. And they're not able to keep Japan safe. This is crucial because this begins the unraveling of Tokugawa power. The shogunate, from this point on, starts to lose. And the imperial family starts to rise up while the Tokugawa shogunate decreases in power, influence, and authority. It becomes increasingly evident to opponents of the shogunate regime that the shogunate can't enforce their, their laws. They don't have the power, they don't have the strength. Mainly because many daimyo aren't listening to them. 
they cannot stop the ban of foreigners traveling around in Japan. Many, many foreigners just start walking around. They start coming in as diplomats, and they want to talk to somebody. Well, they realize that shogunate doesn't really have power, so they start trying to talk to the imperial family. This bodes really ill for the shogunate, because once foreigners start doing this, once Japanese see that foreigners want to talk to the imperial family, to the emperor, not to the shogun, it's over. They don't have power anymore. They don't have control. At this point, it's a question of when. When is the imperial family really going to come to its own? How is this going to happen? Well, we have all these foreigners walking around Japan, and it leads to this phenomenon called uh, Sono Joy. Revere the emperor, expel the barbarian. The idea is that you revere the emperor, you try to bolster imperial authority, and you try to kick out the foreigners. How do you do this? Well, you get these guys called Ishin Shishi, men of spirit. These are kind of like domestic terrorists, um, but they're wrapped so tightly in the Japanese flag you can't fault them. They attack non-Japanese, they attack foreigners. So in 1861, Townsend Harris's interpreter was killed. 1862, a couple Britishers, this is what the Japanese called the British delegates at the time, uh, they ride in front of a Satsuma procession. When you did this, you were supposed to get off your horse and basically bow to the daimyo. They don't do this. So some Ishinchishi kill the British. 1863, there's an imperial order to expel the barbarians. More people die. There's riots. Um, in, 18, in 1863, some French, Dutch, and U.S. ships are sailing past Choshu. And the Chosu open fire on them. Chosu is one of the uh, key domains, the, the key Han, which lends their support to the imperial family. So they're attacked by the Japanese. 1863, British ships shell Kagoshima, which was uh, a prominent city in Satsuma domain. Compounding the issue, we have economic problems. There's a silk disease um, which raises silk prices being exported to Europe. People don't necessarily want to buy this. So, native silk manufacturers in Japan are having problems. This makes other prices rise. This, this makes other prices rise. Uh, the price of rice increases, etc. Up to about 700% by 1867. So, there are severe economic problems, and people can't look to the shogunate to stop these problems. So, where do they look? The imperial family. To try to solve these problems, okay, we have what's called the Union of Court and Camp. Basically, the Kyoto Court and the Bakufu, the Tokugawa Shogunate, try to work together. Um, it promotes activism among the Japanese, among the samurai, among the daimyo, especially direct action, which leads to more assassinations of foreigners and of some Japanese who are trying to work with the foreigners to basically secure Japanese independence. In 1862, we have the end of the Sankin Kotai system, this, the, the end of this um, system where, and I talked about this in other videos, where the Japanese shoguns basically required the daimyo uh, to reside half the year in Edo and keep lavish estates in their own domains. This is ended, so the power of the daimyo gradually begins to increase. They have more money. Between 1864 and 1866, with the formal end of the uh, Sankin Kotai system, the daimyo begin to retreat from Edo and from Kyoto, and they begin to go back to their own domains. They begin to oversee their own land. So what you see is this increase in what eventually becomes Japanese nationalism, but it's not the nation. It's individual domains trying to strengthen themselves to resist the West. So this would be like, to use an example from my own country, the federal government's kind of weak, uh, there are problems. This would be like... The state of New York, the state of New Jersey, Connecticut, and Vermont, you know, just to pick a couple from the East Coast, retreat from the federal government. They retreat in on themselves, and they start building up their own national guards more aggressively. Uh, they develop citizen militias. They try to become more economically uh, autarkic. That's, that's basically what's occurring here. Kind of a rough analogy, but in a way, it 
kind of gets my point across pretty well. This leads to a civil war. Eventually, that civil war culminates in the Meiji Restoration. Um, so we're going to go into more detail with this in the other series, but the members of Satsuma and Chosu, among others, but really Satsuma and, and uh, Chosu, these are two of the key domains, the two key Han systems, which form an alliance, and they eventually back the imperial family. So the Boshin War, the War of the Year of the Dragon, is what finally ousts the Tokugawa shogun from power, and it grants power back to the imperial family, but with a twist. The leaders of these domains who backed the imperial family, and we're going to talk about them more in other videos, are basically there to stay. They become what's known um, as the Meiji oligarch. So the emperor rules, but he's got this cabinet of advisors around him, which, you know, basically function as breaks on his power. The emperor looks like he has control. Uh, really, it's the Meiji oligarchs. On top of all of this, we have more economic problems. So, the ratio of gold to silver in Japan to China was different by a factor of three. So, what happens? Well, fairly astute businessmen start taking the gold from Japan and from China, and they start exchanging it in the other countries for more or less silver, depending on what country you're going to. What this does is it sees a draining of currency from both countries. That's not good, because this country, Japan, is trying to rebuild itself along western lines, where they need a stable monetary system. You can't do that if you're lacking in precious metals. So this is a problem they've got to deal with. Um, as this is going on, the Bakufu tries to reduce the golden coin to by up to two-thirds to match the one-to-five ratio of gold to silver. It weakens the currency, and it just compounds and compounds and compounds until the Bakufu uh, coinage system is basically destroyed, and they're forced to use straight-up gold bullion and silver bullion at international exchange rates. So they lose the ability to basically finance themselves. This is a major reason why the Bakufu simply can't keep up. Once that's done, we start getting into this period of the Meiji Restoration. So the Tokugawa socio-political order um, was fairly long-lasting, it was fairly stable, between about 1600 and about 1868. Um, and gradually what happens is it develops these internal contradictions. So we have the shogunate and the imperial family at odds, uh, there are issues between the shogunate and the daimyo. The shogunate's really the first among equals, but eventually not really. There are cracks in the you know, power edifice there. How do you deal with the samurai? That was never really adequately solved. So there are problems with Tokugawa power, which basically lasts the, through the entire regime. By the mid-1800s, this is a huge problem. The, the Tokugawa have too many issues, and they can't really deal with them all at the same time. This brings down the Tokugawa shogunate, and then we get the Meiji Ishin, the Meiji uh, renewal, the Meiji innovation. The emperor comes back into power. However, what exactly this period should be understood to be is kind of hard. We're going to talk about this more in the last couple of videos in this series, and way more in depth in the companion series to this. Um, but in Japanese studies, the two major questions in modern Japanese studies are, one, was Imperial Japan fascist? Um, I have another series on that going. And the other was, was the Meiji upheaval, the Meiji Ishin? Was it a restoration of Imperial rule? Or was it a revolution? This is something we're going to be dealing with in the next couple episodes. So until then, guys, hope you all enjoyed. Um, I know there was a little bit of a ramble in the beginning, but hopefully it all came together for you in the end. Take care, and I will see you all next time.